So we begin chapter four on kinematics. The average acceleration of a moving object is defined as delta v divided by delta t. <clears throat> this acceleration vector points in the same direction as the vector delta v, the change in velocity. So as an object moves, its velocity vector can change in, in one of two possible ways, or both. One, the magnitude of the velocity can change, so it can speed up or slow down. And two, the direction of the velocity can change. Either one means the object is accelerating. To find the acceleration vector, you start first with, uh, here's a motion diagram, with two velocity vectors, v sub n and v sub n plus 1. So draw the vector, the second vector, and then draw <coughs> negative of the first vector at the tip of n plus 1. We're subtracting these two vectors to form delta v. Delta v connects the tail of the second to the head of the, the first, the negative first one. This delta v vector is in the direction of the acceleration. So now back on the original motion diagram, you can draw the acceleration, acceleration vector at the middle point of the, of the three points. And this is the average acceleration uh, between v sub n and v sub n plus 1. Here we show the motion diagram of someone on a Ferris wheel who is going with uniform circular motion. So in this case, the object is not speeding up or slowing down. This is a constant speed, but it is accelerating. For every pair of adjacent velocity vectors, we can subtract them to find the average acceleration near that point. So let's take here's v sub n and v sub n plus 1, the two vectors at the top. If you subtract those vectors, you get a vector which points straight down. Delta v points straight down, so the acceleration points straight down. Okay. And if you did that for any other point, you'd get delta v pointing always towards the center of the circle, no matter which dot you choose. So this is an acceleration that's due to change in direction with a constant speed. So <clears throat> an object's acceleration can be decomposed into components parallel and perpendicular to the velocity. A sub parallel, these two straight lines, is the acceleration you're probably most familiar with. It's either speeding up or it's slowing down. Okay, that changes the speed. A sub perp, or perpendicular, this little uh, upside down t means perpendicular, is the component of the acceleration which causes a change in direction. Okay? And any object that's moving and changing the direction of its velocity always has a component of the acceleration that's perpendicular to the direction of motion. Projectile motion. So baseballs, tennis balls, people flying through the air can all exhibit projectile motion. A projectile is an object that moves in two dimensions, so some vertical plane here, under the influence of only gravity. Projectile motion extends the idea of free fall to include some horizontal component of the velocity. And in this chapter we will uh, neglect air resistance. So as you can see from this motion diagram, uh, strobe light motion diagram of a tennis ball, uh, projectiles in two dimensions follow this uh, kind of curved trajectory that is actually a parabola. So at the beginning of projectile motion, we call this the launch. There is a launch angle, uh, theta, which is the angle of the initial velocity vector above the x-axis. And we can actually uh, decompose this initial velocity vector into v sub 0 x, initial horizontal component, and v sub 0 y, the initial vertical component. And v sub 0 is just the initial speed. Gravity acts downward. Okay? So the projectile doesn't have any acceleration that's a component that's parallel to x. 
So a sub x is equal to 0. And a sub y is equal to this negative g, where g is uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. So the vertical component of the acceleration is just that of free fall. And the horizontal component of the acceleration is 0. And we can say, actually, projectiles are, are in free fall. So, for example, if we launch an object with an initial uh, y component of velocity of 19.6 meters per second and an initial x component of 9.8 meters per second here at the origin, then one second later, its x component of its velocity will still be 9.8 meters per second. But the y component will have decreased by 9.8, so 19.6 minus 19.8 uh, is 9.8. So at this instant, the object is moving upward at a 45 degree angle. And then two seconds after the launch, the horizontal component is still 9.8 meters per second, but the y component has momentarily gone to zero. Three seconds after launch, it is now going uh, negative 9.8 meters per second in the y direction and still going 9.8 meters per second in the positive x direction. And one, two, three, four seconds after launch, it's crossing the x-axis again. It is now going down with a speed of 19.6 meters per second and still going towards the right with a, a, a speed of 9.8 meters per second. So V sub y, this y component, decreases by 9.8 meters per, per second every second. That's what gravity does. So let's look at this uh, situation. We have uh, an apparatus that releases two balls at the same instant. Okay? Uh, the first ball is simply dropped from some height, and the second ball, the yellow one, is fired uh, in a, in a uh, horizontal direction. Okay, it has the zero y component of its velocity, but it's going towards the right. Which ball hits the ground first? Well, it turns out if air resistance is neglected, the balls hit the ground simultaneously. The initial horizontal velocity here has no influence on the vertical component of the, the ball's motion. Neither ball has any initial vertical motion, so both fall at distance h in the same amount of time. Imagine we have a hunter in the jungle who wants to shoot down a coconut that is hanging from the branch of a tree. He points his arrow directly at the coconut, but the coconut falls from the branch at the exact instant the hunter shoots the arrow. Does the arrow hit the co coconut, or does it go above, or does it go below? Well. Here is a plot of the x and y axis. The coconut is right up here, and the hunter is down at the origin. Without gravity, if there were no acceleration due to gravity, the arrow would follow this uh, straight line. Because of gravity, uh, for any time interval t, the arrow has fallen a distance, one half g t squared, below this line. So here is the actual trajectory, is this parabola. The separation grows as one-half gt squared, giving the trajectory its, its this uh, parabolic shape. So that's the arrow. Let's think about the coconut. Had the coconut stayed on the tree, the arrow would have curved under its target as gravity caused it to fall a distance one-half gt squared, below the straight line. But it didn't, it fell. And one-half gt squared is the distance that the coconut fell while the arrow was in flight. So. They'll both follow the distance one-half gt squared over at the same time t, and by the time the arrow has reached the horizontal position of the coconut, it will be exactly the same distance below the straight line trajectory as the coconut has fallen, and yes, it'll hit it. So let's talk about range. If you have a projectile with some fixed initial speed, v sub zero, but you can vary the launch angle, theta, how far does the object travel over level ground before it returns to the same elevation from which it landed? And 
this distance is sometimes called the range. So if you look in your text and read example 4.5, uh, they derive that this distance turns out to be v sub 0 squared times the sine of 2 times the launch angle divided by g. And if you vary theta between 0, which would be straight into the ground, and uh, 90 degrees, which would be straight up, you'll find that sine of twice of theta has a maximum when theta is 45 degrees. And here we show uh, trajectories all launched at a speed of 99, 99 meters per second and a computation of what the range is. For 15 degrees, it, uh, it's going, going fast in the x direction, but it doesn't get very high, so it doesn't stay up very long, so it only goes about 500 meters. Uh, as you increase the launch angle, it goes further and further until uh, 45 degrees. It uh, reaches a maximum of about 1,000 meters. If you increase the launch angle further, it stays up in the air for a long, long time, but the x component of its velocity is, is low, so it doesn't go very far. So your strategy for projectile motion problems, uh, you first have to model the situation to ignore air resistance. I draw a diagram that establishes a coordinate system with the x-axis horizontal and the y-axis vertical. Okay. And in this case, when you're solving the problem, keep in mind that a sub x equals zero. And that means that the, the final v the final x component of the velocity is equal to the initial x component of the velocity, which is equal to a constant. Okay. a sub y is negative g, meaning that uh, you have these equations of constant acceleration for the y component. Delta t is the same for both the horizontal and vertical components, so you can find delta t from one component and then use that for the other component if that helps you. And at the end, check your result has the correct units, is reasonable, and answers the question. Okay, relative motion. So this figure below shows two people, Amy and Carlos. Amy is standing still and Carlos is riding his bike. And actually there's a third person, Bill, who's uh, driving in a car faster than Carlos. So according to Amy, who is stationary, Carlos's velocity is plus uh, five meters per second, where we've defined the direction to the right to be positive. Okay. So we've written this as v sub x sub c a. This subscript c a means c relative to a. Okay, it's Carlos relative to Amy. <clears throat> but according to Bill, okay, if you were if you were Bill, going at 15 meters per second to the right, you would see that Carlos gets further and further behind you as time goes on. So Carlos is act actually moving backwards. And so we say v sub x of Carlos relative to Bill is negative 10 meters per second. So Carlos has two different velocities depending on who is looking at him. Amy thinks he's going to the right at 5 meters per second. Bill thinks he's going to the left at 10 meters per second. And every velocity is measured relative to a certain observer. There is no true velocity of any object. So, it turns out that the velocity of Carlos relative to Bill is equal to the velocity of Carlos relative to Amy plus the velocity of Amy relative to Bill. And that's one of the reasons we set up these subscripts this way. If we say V sub CB, uh, it's equal to V sub CA plus V sub AB. These inner subscripts A kind of cancel and the outer subscripts become the subscripts of the, the first one. So this is a nice little uh, trick of the, of the notation to help you remember how to add velocities. So if Bill is moving to the right relative to Amy, then Amy is moving to the left relative to Bill, meaning that if you reverse the subscripts, uh, you get a negative. So VAB equals negative VBA and that'll help you set up these equations. So now I want to talk about reference frames. Uh, any coordinate system which is uh, set up by a particular experimenter 
uh, has an x and y axis, and it is called a reference frame. And Bill can set up a ref reference frame, or Amy can set up a reference frame, and either one of them can measure the position and velocity of Carlos. So here's object C, as in, and it's measured in two different reference frames. We have position, which also can use this subscript, of Carlos relative to A, R sub C A, right there. And we can talk about the position of C relative to B, R sub C B. R sub A B is actually just the position of the origin of reference frame A as measured by reference frame B. And it turns out that these uh, displacement vectors add in the same way as we did those relative velocity vectors. R sub C A plus R sub A B equals R sub C B. So these inner A's cancel and the outer subscripts become this CB subscript. Okay. <clears throat> the time derivative of all of these positions gives the velocities. So we have the same thing. V sub CB, the velocity of Carlos in reference frame B, is equal to V sub CA plus V sub AB. So the velocity of Carlos in frame A plus the velocity of reference frame A relative to B. Okay. And the first person to write down all these little equations or to, to really understand them was Galileo, way, way, way back at the beginning of the 1600s. And so these are called the Galilean velocity transformations. And they were updated in the early uh, 1900s by Einstein, who came up with uh, his own uh, uh, transformations of velocity. But these are the ones that you'll be using uh, for this entire course.